the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. I was away this week with our Father in Christ, Metropolitan Joseph, with our Bishop Anthony, and all of our hierarchs, and the clergy of our church, mainly the pastors of parishes, the priests. And we spent a week, as we do every other year, in our clergy symposium. It's a chance for all of us to step back from the work of ministry and to study and to enter deeply into the ministry to which we have been called as clergy. It's a week of heavy theology, very deep concepts, very difficult questions to face. And yet there were also some very basic questions that we studied very deeply. We all believe that in Christ we have our salvation, but just what does that mean? We talked about that. And sometimes it reminded me that sometimes the most basic questions are sometimes the hardest to answer. If I were to ask you, why did you come to church this morning? Think about that for a moment. Think about what your answer would be. For some of you, you might say, well, I come to show my love for God. I love him and I appreciate all that he does for me. And I come to offer him my praise and my thanks. Some of you say that when you come to church, you regain perspective. You understand our place in the universe and in God's creation. Some would tell me that you always come to church on Sunday. You always come and you keep coming. Why? Because you've come before and you keep coming. Some of you would tell me that you're supposed to be here. This is where we should be on a Sunday morning. Now all of those may have elements of good reasons. We talk about why do we do what we do? Why do we come to church? Whether it's a Sunday morning service or another service. Why do we pray? Why do we read the Bible? Why do we go out and love our neighbors? There's all kinds of reasons we might give. Fortunately for us, today St. Paul sums up for us very succinctly and very clearly in today's epistle. His epistle is taken from his epistle to the Romans. Very unique church in the early history of the church. There was a church in the heart of the Roman Empire, in Rome itself, comprised of both Gentiles, Romans, but also Jewish converts to the Christian faith. So if you read the book of Romans carefully, you can see St. Paul struggling to help these two different groups understand they're now one. And so what he expresses, we heard it in the first line of the reading today, he expresses his feeling towards Israel. And he says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. Now, before he even says that, he tells us that his heart's desire is that Israel would be saved. Don't forget who St. Paul was. Before he was Paul, he was Saul. As he says in other epistles, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a leader among his people. Somebody who understood the Jewish faith and understood it well. And so it makes sense to us that he says that it's his will that Israel be saved. But then he goes on to that second part that I read, that he bears witness that they have a seal for God. The Jews who either didn't, hadn't heard the news of Christ yet or heard it and rejected it, he says to them that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. And he goes on to say, and listen carefully, for being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. What he's saying to those Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians in reference to the Jews that did not become Christians, he says that they had a good intention And in some cases, they were even zealous for it. But then he says something very important. It did them no good. 
They took their good intentions, but without analyzing, without thinking carefully why they were doing what they were doing, they ended up doing it for the wrong reasons and for bad results. We might say, well, that's a problem for first century Jewish converts to the faith. I would submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that you and I have that same struggle today. I don't know if any of you converted to Christianity from Judaism, but we all struggle with understanding why we do what we do. And think about the answer you gave for why you came to church today. Some of those answers included God, recognizing Him and His righteousness and our need for Him. But amazingly, so many times we talk about what we do within our quote-unquote religious life, within our spiritual lives, and our reasons don't include God. Now it might sound strange, but there's actually an understandable reason for it. The scriptures tell us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We come to church, and it's easy to forget the part of that that involves God. We come to the services often that we choose to come to at a time of our choosing and find it so hard to conform to what the church instructs us to do. And we even say to ourselves, well, that's not how I'm going to do it and listen in our own thoughts, in our own words, for echoes of what St. Paul was saying to those first century Christians. Those who, in her, his words, were ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own righteousness. How often do we want to do what's right? It's righteous, but it's our version of righteousness. And we sometimes too often decide I will submit to this righteousness, but not that one. And isn't that just submitting to, in a sense, our own righteousness? Amazing how we can even come to church, and too often, and I include myself in this, so let's all be honest, too often, without thoroughly examining why we do, and when we examine, sometimes we find wrong reasons coming to encounter the living God, as I said, is a fearful thing. We saw it played out in this morning's gospel. Demoniacs living among the tombs. It says it was so fierce, people couldn't walk by that way. And it's not like we might think, well, just go over a few blocks and go around. When a way was blocked, that might have been the only way that cut out several miles between one city and the next. So to not pass that way could have been a huge deal. But the sight of those demoniacs was so frightening and perhaps so dangerous that people couldn't walk that way. Jesus comes, and as he does in the Gospels when he faces the demons, he casts them out. He's the Lord. Even the demons understood that clearly. And then the people of the town come. St. Paul wasn't necessarily talking about them, but they come out with zeal. The whole town comes out to see Jesus, to find out what has happened, that these two frightening figures have now been healed of their possession. And look at what their reaction is. The Gospel tells us that they begged Jesus to leave not beg mercy for their sins, for the times they had allowed evil to in, be involved in their lives, not to beg him to stay and to teach them and share with them. They begged Jesus, standing before them in the flesh, to leave. 
So perhaps we can understand a little better why St. Paul needed to write the words that he wrote to the Romans, to the Roman Christians. And perhaps if we think about that even people could encounter Jesus physically, directly, might ask him to leave, then maybe it's not so strange that when we come to come to church or do anything we do in our Christian lives, maybe we can see more often that too often we do that even while we want to reject God. The God who, although He does powerful things, sometimes when we can't grasp it or control it, we don't want that too close. And today the Gospel invites us to consider and ponder which changes has God made in our lives or has tried to make in our lives and our response, without even thinking about it, was to beg Him to leave. I'm sure those people that begged Him to leave did it out of fear. If He could do that powerful work, what might He do with them? Even a good thing can be scary. But what they didn't know, and what we too often don't know, or don't remember, or don't think about, is how loving and good our God is. Does He call us to change? Absolutely. The very first word out of His mouth in His preaching, when He began to preach publicly, was repent. It was to change. But why did He want them to change? He tells us at the end of that same sentence, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here. But you can't have it your way. God is not Burger King. We live in a Burger King world. We want it our way. Or to use St. Paul's words, we want to have our own righteousness. Not knowing the righteousness that comes from God. So my brothers and sisters, today we are invited to think again about what it means to enter the kingdom of God that Jesus invites us to enter. We're invited every time we enter the church for any of the services, any time we go into our place of silence to pray, any time we open our Bibles to read His words, any time we're invited to love the least of his brethren in those needy around us. Those are all invitations to enter the kingdom. And St. Paul tells us in the epistle what the result of that is. That is salvation. To enter his kingdom is to be saved. It is to receive his righteousness because it's his and because he can save. So we're invited to lay aside our own attempt at our own righteousness that we try to do with our own strength. And that brings us to a kingdom of our own making. So let's accept that invitation to the kingdom of God, the good and loving and saving God, who invites any and all change, any and all replacement of what is evil to what is good for our sake, because he loves us and for our salvation. So let's feel that fear if we feel it, but not cling to our own righteousness, but to let go of what is of our own and open ourselves up to what comes from God, to that God who loves us, who offers us a much better version of righteousness than we can often provide ourselves. To him be all glory and majesty and honor 